Great, thank you for coming. And uh, I'd just like to uh, introduce uh, two or three people quickly who have helped me enormously, both in putting this uh, exhibition together and uh, in other aspects of my work. Uh, um, Alina Bliak, why don't you stand up, Alina? She's a um, fine art and landscape photographer. Uh, John, uh, it's hard to name. Son Kiss Kiss, right? Uh, teacher, fame, Delio. And, and somewhere in the back is an old colleague and friend, dear friend of mine, Susan McCartney, great uh, travel uh, photographer who's still out there taking, as I am, pictures. Anyhow, I'm calling it getting the picture because I see, and this is, uh, I write about it in, in my book that is called Getting the Picture, um, one copy of which is, is up here. Uh, I, I see getting the picture as a four-stage process. Um, that uh, step number one is the image seen or anticipated, okay? Step number two is when you release the shutter to capture the image. Step number three, the image is captured and displayed. All this, of course, happens much more rapidly today than when I started photographing uh, 50 or so years ago. And the fourth step is, I call, when the viewer response, the response of somebody else, and in, in case of a portrait, the subject of your picture, but otherwise perhaps somebody else looking at your photograph. And when that fourth step is connected up to the first step, I call it closing the loop. And that's when you get the picture, okay? Uh, we can talk about that a bit more, but that, that is a sort of process that I have evolved over the years. Uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, completely self-taught in photography. I, I didn't study it. I studied political science and linguistics, a lot of other stuff, but uh, uh, not photography. So now we just begin to look at, as I say, I'm not going to comment on every single photograph, but this first one uh, goes back to about 1955 and um, it happens to be Roy Eldridge, a, a great jazz music trumpet player whom I was lucky enough to have known. And he wanted a portrait. And, and uh, for various, and I was living in, in uh, Manhattan at that time, but I, I couldn't get together with him. And there was a uh, TV program called The Sound of Jazz. And I decided I'll do his portrait on uh, television, it, it, from television, it worked out quite well. Um, and these are all what I call weekend pictures because I was working in a completely different field, a medical science writer and editor at that time. And I, I was lucky enough to have known uh, Susan McCartney, who I um, introduced a bit earlier. And, and this was shot in Greenwich Village, Susan and another photographer friend, uh, an Australian friend, John Drake and I, we, we wander around Greenwich Village where I live, uh, taking weekend pictures. So Susan, you may have well been here when I took this broken window picture. Susan also taught me how to develop uh, in, uh, in black and white, which I got to be quite good at. Well, you know, you either did it or you didn't, so to speak. Uh, then I went to Mexico in a, in a non-photographic capacity uh, and uh, again took weekend pictures. Uh, here's, here's one, here's another, not sure, no, back. So 
uh, the place to me is extremely important because philosophically, if that's the word, I see photography from my perspective as uh, uh, my opportunity to capture the time and the place. What uh, is a wonderful German word called the Zeitgeist, uh, the time, the spirit of the time and place. And, and Mexico had a tr tremendous influence on me. Uh, it was just really a weekend and then I had another weekend uh, um, as I say, no, not as a photographer, but, but the people, the light, and many, many things had, had a major influence on my photography, which I'll talk about as we go on. Uh, I then moved, uh, well, I didn't live in, in Mexico. I'm still based in, in, in New York, but I got a job, I wanted to become a professional, full-time professional photographer, and I decided that, that I would take one year to try and save up enough money uh, to live for one year and not be dependent on, on my income from photography because I had no way of knowing how much I, I would or wouldn't, wouldn't get. And, and I took a, a one-year contract with, with a cosmetic company running a cosmetic, a, a French uh, American uh, cosmetic company in, in Munich, Germany and Vienna, Austria, two companies actually. Uh, and the first weekend uh, I, I was in Munich, I took the train to Dachau, which uh, as you probably all know, it was the first Nazi concentration camp before Auschwitz. And uh, it had, uh, I won't again go into a lot of detail, my mother lost um, all of her uh, Russian uh, uh, relatives, uh, my, my mother having been born in Russia and Belarus, uh, had lost all but one of her relatives in Auschwitz. So going to to uh, Dachau was very meaningful for me on a, on a purely personal basis and, and uh, I was able to catch something. Uh, this is winter of 1962, just to give you. And all, on a more positive sign, I'm still essentially, although I had bought a, a, a Leica M3 uh, in Munich, uh, I'm still really just photographing on, uh, on weekends, but um, I was taken to an amusement park by a dear friend, a German friend, uh, who, who was a graphic designer, Michael Engelmann, and, and I saw this picture, uh, this image, and, and I, I had an incredible feeling that after Auschwitz, as I had said uh, and have subsequently written, there was nowhere to go but up. And I'm looking for a theme, a subject uh, to, to uh, propose a magazine article uh, to a couple of German magazines. And, and I saw this image of uh, shadows of children on swings, wh which I felt uh, symbolized the more positive side of Germany, which was in fact um, trying to come to grips with, with the, the whole World War II shame that, that they had in my generation perpetrated uh, 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 in Germany. Uh, and uh, so that I said to Michael Engelmann, uh, this picture is for you, Michael and it's going to go in a museum. I had absolutely no way of knowing that, that four or five years later it would in fact be uh, shown in an exhibition called Photography and the Fine Arts and, and, and taken into the permanent collection of the Metropolitan Museum. So uh, I, I'm obviously very attached emotionally and photographically to the, this particular picture. Uh, th this is another rather more positive uh, uh, picture of children. I'm now actually leaving Munich, Germany, on, on my way uh, to, to Paris, 
uh, where I had an assignment. And, and I actually photographed uh, this picture from a car window uh, um, and uh, came out quite well. It, it's been, by the way, stolen and copied uh, on record albums and book jackets, uh, or a couple of times with my permission, uh, a couple of times. It's quite well known in Europe, this, this picture. Uh, importance of copyright, we can talk about uh, later. This is uh, one of my first uh, assignment stories, what was about the, uh, the new generation in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and, and I did a series on uh, uh, creative people, pretty much of my own generation, because I, I had wondered, you know, what were they doing? I have no idea. It obviously was photographed in a mirror. Oh, and it was the end, it was the last picture I took of a series of, of, of uh, ballet dancers rehearsing. Uh, I have no idea how I was able to take this picture, maybe you can figure out and tell me, <laughs> without <laughs> having myself uh, reflected in the mirror. Uh, uh, this is a, um, I'm now getting into color, this is a part of the story that I did, turned out for uh, not only German, but for an Italian magazine called Domus, uh, an Italian design magazine. And um, um, it, it, my, my reportage got, uh, I, I had phoned the, the editor publisher and she had said to me, I like your ideas. Again, after Auschwitz, the only way uh, to go is up. Uh, it didn't end up being called that uh, in Italian. They, they called it Sondaggio in Germania, which means survey, German survey, which is not quite the same thing. But, but in any event, it, it has become um, a, quite a well-known uh, photograph of a, 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 a German uh, artist group uh, called the Zero Group that is going to be having a major exhibition next year at the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, so this, this photograph is very much in demand. Uh, Joseph Boyce, who's standing, is actually making a zero, as you can see. Uh, it was so cold when I took th th this picture. It was the breakfast uh, in the gallery owner's uh, apartment. We were actually drinking uh, uh, with, uh, scotch whiskey out of the coffee cups. I was also afraid using film that, that it would cre create, uh, this was on a, on a uh, hustle blood, uh, um, that the, the moving of the, the uh, film uh, w would create static, but it, it didn't, so I was lucky. Uh, this is another picture uh, f f from that same series, essentially, it happens to be in New York. And, uh, I'm now back in New York uh, photographing for uh, a number of, of uh, major, uh, to me, major clients. This one was for Knoll International uh, Furniture Manufacturer, and I had, the I had the idea of putting the chairs in your office before uh, your office is even finished. I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was a great idea. Uh, the designer, uh, Massimo Vignelli, uh, loved it. Uh, the president, uh, and it was the first picture I, I, or the first assignment I did for Noll. The president of, of the um, company uh, rejected the picture. Uh, rejection is something that we learn to live with as a freelance person, especially as a photographer, uh, because he said it was messy, okay. I nearly resigned the job uh, there and then, but I, I, I kept going and, uh, and ended up photographing, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, about seven or eight uh, brochures and ads for, for, for the company. Uh, but they never used they never used this picture. There, I think there's some more coming up a bit later. Coming back to Mexico had tremendous influence on me. Uh, this now is an assignment I did for New York Times Magazine and uh, Harper's Bazaar 
uh, on the work of, of a uh, Mexican architect called Luis Barragan. Um, Barragan was so shy uh, that he, he refused to have his portrait taken until I said to him, I tell you, Luis, I'll make you look like a Magritte. And he, he liked the idea, and he let me take this picture. This is a picture you couldn't take in, in uh, Mexico City. It's right in the middle of his house, in the middle of Mexico. You couldn't take this picture in Mexico City today because you wouldn't see a sky like this because of air pollution. Uh, this is back to Null. Um, um, again, uh, I suppose you could now call a typical John Null photo in that I, I had the idea of putting the chairs at the, what Vignelli called the destination, namely these chairs are used in universities. Uh, and so I took the, or had the chairs taken to Null and, and uh, put them uh, 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 taken uh, to Yale uh, and uh, in the Surinam architecture it seemed to fit very nicely. Uh, and uh, the, the kid running in the background was, was again, a John Dow moment. I did not set it up, but this seems to happen to me uh, quite a lot um, then and now. I uh, can't quite explain that factor, but it, it's a wonderful one to have working for you. But uh, maybe it's a matter of being re certainly ready for the unexpected. Uh, it's another, another null brochure. Th this one is interesting because it was also uh, improvised. Uh, uh, I didn't know at the time. This happens to be Francesca uh, Breuer who's the daughter of Marcel Breuer, who designed, in whose house I photographed, uh, in New Canaan, Connecticut, in whose house I photographed the Knoll, the, the, the Breuer chairs for Knoll. And she happened to be sitting there. I didn't ask her to sit there. And, and I wasn't aware even then that this chair, now famously, I call, is, is the Francesca chair, in case you have one, you know. Uh, this is another. A, a portrait, uh, or a portrait. Uh, I, I set this up uh, to photograph the Betoya chairs. Uh, I had the idea of putting them in Harry Betoya's studio, and he said, you can do whatever you like as long as you don't interrupt me in my work. So I just let him work, and, and my assistant and I uh, placed these chairs uh, strategically and the light middle of winter uh, not much uh, supplementary lighting here I think I may have had uh, one uh, hot light bouncing out of an umbrella behind the camera not more uh, people tend to I think over complicate lighting it's another existential uh, John Nahr kind of picture because, again, uh, I, I put the chairs in front of the, uh, these are Pollock chairs, in front of the Seacombe building, and, and that, that wonderful uh, woman in, in the red jacket uh, walked by. So uh, I did a um, number of 23 buildings around the world for IBM, and this one happens to be in Milan. Uh, I did in fact, asked my, my IBM contact to walk. I thought architecturally that this picture was a bit uh, cold without a human figure. And I did, uh, on this picture, ask him to, to, to walk, walk, walk up there, which he did very, of course, he was elegantly dressed as all Italians usually are. Uh, I think it helps. What I try to attain in my photography uh, is a third dimension. You get pulled into the picture. Uh, and and uh, to me, photography, I should have perhaps said at the beginning, it, it's really a magic process. Yes, we can buy all this wonderful stuff. 
at B and H, which we'll do shortly after I finish, spend our, our fortunes here in good cause. But but to me, the that process that I described earlier is it, yes, there are techniques, and one can improve uh, a, a lot of things in, in in one's picture taking. But but there are certain qualities that I find very hard. To, I'm not a teacher, so uh, perhaps John and other teachers here can, ex can teach and explain how do you get that. Well, I suppose I got that feeling of depth by, by asking that guy to, to walk up those steps, come to think of it. I hadn't thought of it much before now. Uh, this is one of, uh, this is an interior that I did. It was the first time New York Magazine ever used color for uh, an interior for, in his Sunday magazine section for uh, on a, Ward Bennett's apartment then in the Dakota. Uh, we seem to have come back to this one. I'm, oh, this is a portrait I did of uh, Joseph Albers, the famous Bauhaus paint, painter. When he, I met Albers through Barragan, uh, the Mexican architect. When Albers commissioned me to take his portrait, he said to me, uh, I, I want you to take a portrait the world will remember me by. It's quite a challenge. I took the picture, sent it to actually his wife, Annie Albers, who was his manager, a wonderful artist, in her own right, uh, and she phones me about uh, 10 days later saying, Joseph's very unhappy, and uh, I, I said, oh my God, he doesn't like my portrait. He said, oh no, 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 he loves your portrait, but you didn't charge him enough money. And Albus actually paid me twice what I billed him, said you've got to increase your fees. So. He also gave me a beautiful yellow lithograph that he dedicated, so that was very nice. Uh, another portrait uh, for Connoisseur magazine. Uh, Harry Torchner was an attorney who happened to be Magritte's attorney, and he happened to have been the model of this particular painting and Magritte did not, uh, Magritte paid uh, Torchner in paintings so he did pretty well. <laughs> now we come to doing pretty well Andy Warhol on the red sofa in the silver factory and um, I got commissioned to take this or Andy Warhol's portrait for a feature article uh, that Milton Glaser, uh, who designed the famous I Love New York logo, by the way, um, uh, Milton Glaser was redesigning New York Magazine then, 1965, was a supplement, probably, anybody remember? In, in, the Sunday, right, in the Sunday uh, New York Herald Tribune. It hadn't yet become an independent magazine. Uh, and uh, at that point, um, I worked both with art directors who like to come out on location and others who, who simply say, oh, you go out and, as, as Vignelli did and Milton Glade, you you take a beautiful picture or pictures for me and I'll, I'll do the rest. So anyhow, I turn up in the factory, uh, which in those days was on uh, East 47th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, so it happened to be three blocks from where I was living. I couldn't afford, this is 1965, but, uh, so I'd been a professional photographer for just over a year, second year uh, as a professional. I couldn't afford an assistant. Uh, I got paid $100 for taking, which wasn't too bad in those days. Uh, I turned up at, at the, uh, warehouse building uh, 
with my, uh, again using the Hasselblad, uh, which by the way is not my favorite camera, uh, not then, not now, but that's another story. Um, and Andy meets me, I knew him from, we all knew Andy Warhol from Max's Kansas City, where he'd hang out. Uh, you never really knew him unless you were one of his entourage, which I was not. Uh, but in any event, he, he, when I turn up about three o'clock in the afternoon, he says, look, I'm filming uh, uh, Poor Little Rich Girl. Uh, uh, do you mind waiting? And he, he ushered me into his, he was very, very polite, ultra polite, um, ushers me into his office, what he called. Uh, that red sofa was not there, by the way. Uh, and he said, you know, you can move, do anything you want. So uh, I, I saw the red sofa in the corner. Uh, it was on wheels and I, it was the red sofa on which he had filmed Blowjob, by the way. So it was kind of a historic, uh, but it was red. And I thought, oh yeah. And then I found all the, I mean, stereo was there. But I found that little silver car and the silver whatever it is, disco light. And I, I put my, naturally, uh, House of Blood, you put on a tripod. I had one hot light, uh, uh, quartz halogens, movie, little movie light that I bounced out of. The, the first umbrellas, by the way, came in at that time. I don't know whether you realize umbrellas were developed, white umbrellas were developed, Susan would know this, Susan McCartney, right? Sam the Umbrella Man on 57th Street, right? And the only trouble with using an umbrella on the hot light is if you're not careful, you can set it on fire. In any event, I was already pretty much uh, with this picture, Andy comes in and as I figured, he's tired. Uh, so he again says, uh, what can I do? And Andy was one of those people. He, if I had said, Andy, take your pants off, he, he would have, he'd do anything, literally. I said, well, you know, why don't you just relax? And he did. I shot one roll of film, uh, no Polaroid, um, 12 pictures. Um, and it, um, I felt okay. So I then moved on to, um, to well, I, I moved on uh, being set up before I actually took the picture. I, I moved it into, it didn't take that long, I'm saying, uh, without, even without an assistant. I moved into the big room next door where he was filming. Uh, uh, it, it, um, Sedgwick, who's standing there, and, and the rest of his. These are, if you're into that era, I mean, the, you know, Gerard Malanga, the, the, these are, you know, some of the key figures in, in exactly the entourage of Andy Warhol. So uh, I, I have never been able to see the film. Has anybody ever seen that film, by the way? No called Poor Little Rich Girl. But it may be, I'm working with the Japanese Museum right now, they're reconstructing an Andy Warhol exhibition, so I'm asking them to try and fi find the film. Uh, I, I try, try, tragically, uh, uh, well, Andy Warhol's uh, entourage is heavy into drugs, and, and uh, Factory Girl, Edie, Cedric um, died of an overdose um, a few months, I think, after I took that picture. I remember maybe uh, the crowd want to hear the story that you mentioned about Andy Warhol in the Silver Factory where when you showed him the picture. Oh, you want me to? Oh, okay, okay. I, I didn't know whether I had time. Um, Alina's my timekeeper here. I'll go. Um, I'm not showing the picture for Andy Warhol's permission. Keep in mind, I'm photographing the picture for New York Magazine and Milton Glaser loved it, and it was a full page in you know, the story. Um, I didn't see it. You see, in those days, you didn't see things that rapidly. Uh, I eventually get proofs from the magazine. Uh, 
with this photograph in it. So I take it to uh, a a Andy in, in, in the silver factory. So it's about 10 days after. And he says, oh, I love my portrait. He said, you know, it's the most beautiful portrait of me I have ever taken. And I said, but Andy, you remember, I had my camera on tripod. He, he said, and we had a long discussion, which I won't go into detail, uh, a philosophical discussion of why the subject is as important, this is Andy Wall, not me, why the subject is as important as the person taking the picture. Because think about it, when sometimes you want to take somebody's portrait and they say, oh, don't take my, I take a lousy picture. And then I always say, well, I'm taking the picture, not you. So in any event, I have this sort of uh, uh, really bizarre uh, uh, dialogue with, with Andy. And it ends up with, he, and, and he was really quite adamant because he referred to, I'd see him, uh, quite a bit, because I photographed him uh, uh, two more times, as, as I show you, or oh, one more time I have here, uh, and then later after he'd been shot. Um, uh, the point that, that he made was that um, he would he would say that he had taken the picture, but he said, John, you can keep the copyright. <laughs> Well, I can tell you I've made um, a lot more than $100 on reselling this particular photograph. Uh, so, but every time I saw Andy, um, either at Maxie's Candles or oh, wait, I, this is a portrait I did for, uh, in 1974, so this is nine years after after uh, Andy in, in the Silver Factory. He's now uh, in, in the second factory within Union Square. Uh, and uh, um, I'm particularly fond of, of this picture because it seemed to capture, uh, this was not as, first place is shot with a uh, 35 millimeter film, uh, not as set up, so to speak, as, as the red sofa picture, but um, both he and posterity has very much uh, called this another iconic <coughs> John La picture. So I'm I'm very happy as he was that I was able to catch him at two different stages of of his life. This is you know somewhat. Um, before he, he died, stupidly died, uh, of a hospital malpractice, not by being shot, as I think most of you probably know. Uh, I seem to be in the, the tragic area. Uh, can anybody, oh, how many of you know, what, what's the most famous, uh, uh, Andy Warhol is now uh, rated as the most famous uh, artist of the 20th century okay above picasso incredible how many of you know what the most famous song recently uh, uh announced uh, of the 20th century was any any guesses as to what that might be i can't sing but how about a day in the life does that mean anything to anybody here of this generation the Beatles, right? Yeah. Hmm? The Beatles. The Beatles, right, exactly. John Lennon. This photograph is of Tara Brown, who was a close friend of McCartney, the other McCartney, and, and John Lennon. Uh, and I photographed it for a story on Swinging London. Um, and he, he, the car is an AC Cobra. It's the first painted psychedelic car ever. This photograph, by the way, has never been published, except in my book, Getting the Picture. Uh, two weeks after I 
took this picture, Tara Brown is, is uh, driving a, a different car, a Lotus, this is an AC Cobra, driving a Lotus Elan through a red light. He didn't know the light was red. He, he blew his mind out in a car, he didn't know the light was red. And he died uh, in that crash, and that was the time when, when there was a rumor that that uh, Paul McCartney had died, because if you look closely at this picture, you'll see that, of course, they all had the same kind of hairdo. So, that 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 is. Um, and that's what inspired the song. That yes, and this was yeah. Thank you. This was the this is and then. Uh, um, Lennon and McCartney wrote the song, day, A Day in the Life. It's worth listening to in terms of looking at this photograph because it explains quite a bit more than I have time, but he was in the House of Lords. He, he was uh, uh, one of the heirs of the Guinness uh, founder, uh, family, uh, Tara, the Honorable Tara, Tara Brown. So. It's it's a beautifully written uh, song, by the way. Uh, sw switching gears a bit, 1968. Uh, this is one of the last covers I shot for the Saturday Evening Post, and uh, I uh, they again the art director said, "Oh, go on out and." Uh, shoot me a cover. It was quite a challenge. And I went to a place, I, f I don't know why, I never really heard, although I lived in Midtown Manhattan. I went to East New York, which is sort of beyond Brooklyn, and I found these kids. And um, I actually um, did put those posters there. So it worked out quite well. Now we are 1972. Um, I'm asked by a client in London, phoned me in my own studio apartment on East 50th Street. Uh, Alan Fletcher, the, one of the partners of Pentagram, <laughs> Want to open the, they wanted to open an office in New York and they wanted a theme of a brochure or possible book. And after quite a long discussion, they wanted a New York theme, obviously. And if it, most, some of you were probably around in 1972, you know, this was the beginning of the spray can graffiti phenomenon in New York and I ended up photographing, the, I was the first professional photographer actually to systematically document. I did it on a, uh, did the book on a 10 day assignment uh, from Pentagram uh, uh, all around the city except for uh, Staten Island. And on day one, the uh, art director uh, from Pentagram comes to my apartment uh, uh, in New York and says to me, well, how are we going to do this book, John? And I, I said to him, I went into my pocket and I took out, remember Subway Tilkins? I said, Mervyn. Do you know what this? He said, no. I said, well, it's a subway token. One for you, one for me. And I'm going to take you uh, to the A train, and we're going to go uptown, and we'll find graffiti. And incredibly, again, this is one of those uh, timings that seem to happen so often to me, um, was as we got out the train, I figure 105th, no, it's hard. Yeah, uh, 155th Street. St. Nicholas Avenue on the A train. Get out of the train, and here I am with my two, now two cameras, like uh, a Leica M4, uh, a Nikon FM. Um, two o'clock in the afternoon, very cold, 
uh, December 72. And on the platform were nine children. And one of them, the guy in the, the second guy from, or the guy in the middle in the front, comes up to me, looks at my cameras, and says, hey, nice cameras, man. Uh, you know, I'm not exactly threatened uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, by a bunch of 12-year-olds. I uh, also was in, in company. Uh, uh, so I always believe in telling the truth, because, you know, he, he, he says to me, well, you know, what are you, because we're obviously not your average uh, neighborhood people, we're not your average tourists. Uh, he, Mervyn, was a kind of Keith Richards look-alike, and I was wearing an L.L. Bean uh, warden's jacket, you know, I had slightly longer hair in those days. Uh, so anyhow, always, uh, this kid says, well, you know, what, what are you guys up to? I always believe in telling the truth because it's so much easier than, <laughs> than inventing something. So I said, well, we're doing a book on graffiti. And they all start laughing. And I said, well, what's so funny about graffiti? So they said, well, we are graffiti writers. <laughs> And they spend, the, uh, and they said, do you want us to show you our work? So, of course. So for the next 10 days, uh, uh, I, I, uh, it, it, these kids, uh, they were not graffiti ma kings or masters. They are they're what in the graffiti world are known as toys, but they were very sweet. Uh, and they took me around, introduced me to some of the masters, and I took these pictures for, in my book, The Faith of Graffiti and, and the version of it here, which is an even better printed book called The Birth of Graffiti. Uh, wonderful New York City, late winter sunlight. Uh, and again, catching that, that unforeseen moment of, of, I'm not just interested in the, quote, graffiti as such. I'm interested in the context of, again, the zeitgeist, the space, the place. I mean, in the graffiti world, the, any graffiti writer would know exactly when and where this picture was taken. It was, I remember that it was in Brooklyn and it was late afternoon. But the mother and the child, they just happened to walk in front of my, my camera, in front of my lens. It's uh, another one. Um, this is uptown. Um, can you all, any, everybody see the, the ball? I don't know how to point it out, but it is. Again, uh, I saw the composition, and I stood there kind of waiting. Did I really see that ball when I clicked the shutter? I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. If I was lucky, well, it was certainly good timing, put it that way. So. Oh, wrong way. Uh, so here's the book. There's copies of it up here. Uh, very well printed, by the way. This is printed in Germany. Uh, much better printed that than the first American. And, and, and more pictures, more photographs than, than, and than in the, uh, the... The first version was a designer's book. This is a photographer's book that I had, I had more input into. Uh, including the, uh, the, the title. Uh, as an author of, of now 12 books, including this one, uh, I can tell you that, that authors don't always get much chance to either pick their cover photographs. I, I had to phone the president of Prestel uh, w with a threat to withdraw the whole book if he didn't, he, he wanted to use a different photo on the cover and very, you know, I, I did get my way, but it was, it was hard fighting. Uh, th this is a much more recent graffiti picture uh, shot now 
By the way, everything we've seen so far has been on film. This was from a couple of years ago uh, with digital. And I think most of the rest of the pictures, not all of them, w w will be digital. Uh, this is a very famous uh, graffiti writer, a, a real master, a king, called Stay High. Uh, and uh, because I'm now, because of the book and because of the fact that, that uh, Norman May I had gotten Norman Mailer to write the introduction to the first graffiti book uh, I did, um, uh, you know, I've become quite well known in, in the world of graffiti anyway. And uh, um, the old timers ha have a session pretty much every, every year. But I, uh, interestingly, uh, around 155th Street and, and, and St. Nicholas Avenue, which by the way has changed demographically. The, the original graffiti writers, including Stay High, were ghetto children. In fact, uh, Stay High, whose name was Wayne Roberts, uh, called himself the voice of the ghetto. Today, graffiti is done mostly by, by um, middle class children uh, around the world, which is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, in any event, I, I, th this photograph, I, I sold this photograph uh, uh, this last summer to, to the New York Times for Wayne Roberts' obituary. He, he had been heavily into drugs. Uh, uh, the, uh, most of the other graffiti writers I photographed actually ha turned out to have different careers. Uh, Wayne remained, if the word is true, faithful to being a graffiti writer. A and he was uncompromising. And uh, in his own way, you know, a, a wonderful person. I, vis I gave him a copy of this portrait when he was in the hospital in the Bronx, uh, just before he died. Um, but um, he, he was uh, and is one of the, one of the greats. Uh, Twelve years ago, I moved to from Midtown Manhattan. I ran out of space, and I moved to Trenton, New Jersey, where I now live. And um, these are some of the pictures that I've taken there. Uh, um, this is a couple of. Oh, this is maybe, this is an early digital picture. Uh, I, I, it was in a recent exhibition I had at the New Jersey State Museum. Uh, a number of people said, oh, you set that up. And I can assure you, I did not set that, this picture up. But again, it's just one of those moments where everything struck me as being in the right place. The, Pot of paint and the. I should uh, give credit here also to Alina Pliak, who, who who does help me considerably. You can't literally see it in this picture as much, but she is a master. Aside from being a great uh, fine art and landscape photographer in her own right, she she is a great great printer, and she helps me considerably get the best out of my prints. So all of these prints here have been done with her wonderful help. Uh, this is a portrait I did of a current graffiti writer in Trenton who has uh, become a mirror. He's a, as some of the other graffiti uh, writers have been a few. Uh, I don't want to get into the discussion here. Norman Mailer called graffiti an art form and, and uh, went to great lengths to explain that. I, I do not consider that to be the case, but uh, I think it's a, a very important phenomenon 
uh, graphically. A and uh, Casso, as uh, uh, this uh, painter is known, has become a, a wonderful mural painter in, in the Trenton area. And he works a lot uh, in neighborhood, uh, teaching children to paint and to do murals. And is very involved in, in a lot of uh, important uh, art-related uh, teaching projects. So I'm very proud uh, to be a friend. And, and I do uh, document, he, he has started something uh, called a Gandhi Garden uh, about three blocks from where I live, actually, uh, getting children to recycle uh, rubber tires and uh, other detritus in, in, in the streets and, and putting it in, in, into growing uh, uh, food and flowers uh, behind a mural. I don't have a yet, a, I haven't photographed it yet because uh, the, the weather hasn't been uh, too, uh, but the first. Uh, the garden products should be coming out quite soon and something that I'm very happy and proud to keep documenting because I think it shows how photography can be used as a force for social change. Uh, oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Uh, this is a picture I took in Paris after an exhibition there uh, running for the train um, uh, my, uh, with my friends. And I love the light in Paris, um, especially in the rain. And this I shot literally uh, about two minutes to 11.30 p.m., which was the last train to, to Chalandry, where I was staying with, with friends in, in Burgundy. Uh, and and I, I, I was willing, well, I didn't want to miss the train, but I just, you know, was able again to capture something of that feeling of depth, of, of the third dimension that I, 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 I talked about earlier. Um, and I think it came out quite well. Uh, if I can get the right, sorry. Uh, this is a portrait I did last year. This is where Alina was enormously helpful. I set this picture up with, with uh, Harry, uh, who happens to be a cousin of mine. He's a professor of art at, at um, Ryder University, and he was having an exhibition. And uh, with, of course, a pretty good art director. Uh, so we set it up. And uh, um, I neglected uh, one thing, which is not apparent in this photograph, that the l lighting, even though, again, I'm now working with a Nikon 7000, so you're looking you know, pretty much at what you're taking, uh, and everything's in place. Uh, I was using a... Um, a bounce flash and, pos and uh, two flashes, uh, uh, small. Uh, but when we came to look, and I don't have the, the first version of it, it the picture was, was beautiful, but Harry's important etchings were reflected the yellowness. For, see, I like to use as much natural light as possible. You can see the sunlight coming in. And he had a, an electric you know, incandescent light uh, in his studio. Oh, one more, yes. This is a very recent portrait I did of a, uh, uh, you know, I started with Roy Eldridge as uh, trumpeter. And, and I call this picture uh, uh, Trumpet Finale. So it's the last of, the photo, of my photographs I'm going to show you today. Uh, there's a lot more in my books, of course. Uh, um, I, you, I will 
I shot this uh, in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Museum uh, about six weeks ago uh, with my Nikon um, 30, uh, 5100. Um, this was, uh, and uh, he wanted, um, uh, he said more than, I mean, he's an up and coming, but he's pretty well known in the Philadelphia and other areas around the um, uh, jazz and uh, uh, trumpet and still drum player. Uh, and, and he wanted a, a record um, album cover and he wanted some other uses. And I, I photographed, this is the uh, uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, which happened, and we were going to go inside, and I, I had had permission to photograph him inside. I've forgotten quite what we were looking, but the museum was, by the time, this was literally the last of about a hundred shots I did. And, and, and another interesting, phenomenon that I don't know whether Susan and others, John and uh, you find, very often, uh, let's say I, I don't ever count the number of pictures I take. I, I know I shot one roll of Hasselblad film, 120 film uh, of Andy Warhol on, on the red sofa. Uh, that I remember. Uh, but if I'm doing a portrait such as this, let's say over a two or three our period uh, with a couple of cameras. Uh, I'd probably take a hundred pictures. And then, and I am looking, you know, looking at them, sometimes showing them to the client in, in this case. He seemed quite happy. And the best two pictures I took were number one and number a hundred. <laughs> this is literally the last picture I took. And I can't, I mean, I, you know, I, I saw the space. Uh, I, I, I maybe shot two or three there. But I knew when, and of course, late afternoon, um, I saw the picture, you know, I suppose what you say compositionally, so I said, oh, you know, play, and I got him actually to play, because I felt existentially I wanted to get the context, uh, and I clicked, and, and I, again, as in the picture I talked about earlier, the, I happen to see it here, the children are swings. Um, I, um, it's one of those, and I think Susan and, and, and all of you photographers, John, Alina, and Faye, uh, I think you, when you get the picture, you, you, you often get that terrific sense of you've got it, yes. right? right. And it's, I mean, to me, that's what it's all about. And then to share it as I am now with people like you who really care, especially the, the only real criticism that I will accept are from my peers and people who, like you, who, who really share what I described, uh, the passion. Because if you're not really passionate about, about it, you know, go and do something else. I'm intrigued by the design on the steps. I assume yes. the shadows. Are those shadows? Or they're, uh, were they yes. No. Yes. Shadows. So you saw that yeah, you wanted it. I those guess. shadows are, are from the railing. Yes, that's what I thought. It, again, it's late afternoon. It's the last shot, so the sun is beginning. You know, I and they're didn't. They're almost a picture in themselves. Yeah. So they make the, they make the shadows. Yes. To me, it's important yes. To the whole shot. Yeah, you're it absolutely leads you right up there. You're absolutely right. I, I, didn't, I didn't plan it that way. Uh, it's only that, and, and he's very satisfied before 
we get here and I think we're walking to the car park and so I was the one I had a feeling that was from I knew he he was satisfied you know so I had done my assignment but so artistically <laughs> if I may use that word about my I had a feeling there's just one more thing that and I didn't quite know what it was, but then I saw the architecture. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we tried to, I can't remember, I think we tried to get in that door, but I did see the architecture, and I thought, wow, you know. So I said, you know, play me some stuff. And so then, click, click, click. So I did three pictures, but I could, you know, it did come together. I think partly because I was, Again, I don't believe in luck, <laughs> as you probably gathered from earlier things I've said. So I think it kind of came together at that moment. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, Cartier Bresson talks about decisive moment, which, which is, I mean, a wonderful concept. I, I, I you know, but it, it was, maybe that's what it is. Do you want to, do you want to, yeah. Almost like, almost like Hmm? It's almost like written music. Yeah. It's oh, like written, yes. Written music yeah. going up. Yes. 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 No, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you share my enthusiasm for this particular picture because, as I say, I started off with a trumpet player, and here's one for the ending. So pretty much. The, that's the end. I mean, but if you want to come up and uh, look at the... Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.